All right, I'm going to ask you a question, and then we'll get into the, uh, into the message tonight. This was posed to me, and it was quite a remarkable thing when I dealt with it. Now, I'm going to give you a partial quotation of a verse of Scripture, and I want you to fill in the word that's missing. The blank also shall dwell with the Lamb. The what? Lion. How many say lion? All right. How many say something else? Well, we've got the Bible. All we've got to do is turn to it. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's in concrete, in other words. How many say the lion? That's a good... Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill in the blank again one more time. The blank, sh the blank also shall dwell with the lamb. How many say lion? Raise your hand. Some of you aren't sure now. All right. Turn to Isaiah chapter 11 and verse number 6. Eleven six. Okay. All right. Do, do, does anybody have a Bible that says the lion? What does it say? All right. Now, that's not to trick you. That's to make you think. Uh it was naturally in your mind to say lion. See, it was natural. I mean, that's what you thought, right? How many of you have ever heard of the Mandela effect? A few of you have. Well, according to the, according to the idea is that the CERN uh, Hadron Large, Large Hadron Collider has been able to tap into time and by supernatural demonic forces, they have been able to go back in time and change your very Bible. That at one time your Bible says the lion shall dwell with the lamb. And that everybody had that in their heart and in their mind because that's what you grew up reading. How many of you would say tonight without doubt, without a doubt, that you know for certain that you grew up reading the lion shall dwell with the lamb? All right, few of you do. Few of you do. I mean, it was indelibly impressed in your soul. All right. Now, you talk about a wild idea, and that is that they are able to move in time and go back and change your Bible. Now, this is only one place. There's a number of other places. All you have to do is type in the Mandela Effect, Google it, or go to YouTube, and you'll find, you'll find all kinds of material. The reason that I know about it is because a lady sent me an email a couple of days ago and she wanted to know what I thought about it. And that came out of the clear blue. I had no idea what she's talking about. But I immediately got on the internet and started doing some research into it. And the reason I did that is because I'm a teacher and I'm responsible, I'm accountable. And I don't know all the answers to everything for certain. No man can. But I got into the I got into the uh, I got into a little research. Now some some research, not a whole lot, but some. And I discovered that there's an awful lot of controversy out there as to whether or not this is a legitimate thing. Now here's the problem. The problem is that if they are able to go back in time and change your Bible, then what they have done is altered the Word of God, and you can no longer trust the book you have in your hands. How many of you listening to me here? I mean, you, are you understanding the ramifications of what I'm saying? Now, I don't believe that. His scripture, the scripture is forever settled in heaven. Here's what I do believe. Here's what I do believe. I believe that the occult world is working a psyop on people, which means that they are messing with your mind, causing you to doubt and... Uh, causing you to, uh, to, to wonder. 
Because the truth of the matter is, when I first read that, I thought, I had to go look up Isaiah 11, 6. I mean, I've preached from that text how many times in 40 years? But I had to go look it up. And my Bible says, the wolf shall lie down with the lamb. Now, I either accept one of two positions. And that is that the wolf lies down with the lamb was in the Hebrew Masoretic text because that's what the Isaiah 11 is translated from. Not Greek, but Hebrew. It's either in the Hebrew Masoretic text as wolf lies down with the lamb or it's something else in the Hebrew Masoretic text. In other words, the lion. Now, if I could go back and find where it says lion in the Hebrew text, I'd begin to say to myself, what's going on? But I don't believe that's the case whatsoever. Not at all. What I did try to do was find some old commentaries and some old works that made reference to Isaiah 11:6. In plain words, if this thing of going back in time and changing the Scripture, they're going to have to change a reference to it to everything that has been preached, said, sung, written, for the last how many centuries in the Christian church. And everywhere I have looked, it says, wolf lies down with the lamb. So I'm satisfied that the Bible I've got in my hand is just fine, but I have never seen an assault on it quite as clever as this one. This is working on your mind. And uh, some of you will go out of here tonight and you'll think, what in the world's going on? And uh, did you look in your Bible to Isaiah eleven six? Now, if you got a funny Bible, no telling what it's liable to say. <laughs> but it, as the old as the old folks up in the mountains say, if you got a real Bible, it'll say the wolf lies down with the lamb. <laughs> oh, law! <laughs> I want you to turn to the book of First Timothy, chapter one. And verse number 9, 1 Timothy 1, 9, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and injurious. But I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Father, I pray you'd bless this holy book tonight. Give me wisdom, Lord, in the scriptures. Don't let me, Lord, lead people astray. Don't let me get into heresy. Father, keep me straight in the word of God. In thy name I pray, amen. This past Sunday was a very refreshing day for me. Very refreshing. I got something for my soul I greatly enjoyed the preaching, and it helped me greatly. Uh, it helped me on two fronts. It helped me with the fact that I didn't give out. I was sitting taking in, which in itself is a great help. But not only that, I took in good stuff. Because this young man who came and preached in here Sunday preached the Bible, and he did a fine job preaching. Every time I hear him preach, uh, he rises more in my estimation and I respect him more. I firmly believe that he has the what's called the unction, the anointing of God on his preaching. Now I'm talking about C.T. Townsend. He's a young man. I think he's still in his 20s, isn't he? 34. What, what now? 34. 34, all right. <coughs> 34, my book's young, amen. <laughs> and uh, he's, got, uh, he's got the unction of God on him, folks. You either have it or you don't. The old timers wanted that. They wanted that greatly because they knew it made all the difference in the world. On one hand, you can have an intellectual lecture from a professor, PhD or THD or whatever, 
however many degrees he's got hanging off his, his chest. Or you can have somebody who comes out of the coal yard or comes out of the field or comes off of the mechanics uh, shop or whatever and takes a hold of the Bible and, and God takes hold of him. And that's what makes all the difference in the world. Then you're hearing from God. You're hearing from heaven, folks. Let me tell you now, I've seen both sides of the picture. I've been on both sides. I've been there. I've seen all of that. I've been to their schools. I've studied their books. I've read their material. Spent years dealing with this. A lot of good men involved in this thing. A lot of good men. But folks, there is no substitute for that unction, for that anointing, that anointing of God. That's the power of God. And uh, God blessed me. He used him. He helped me. And that's not even to mention that we had seven people saved Sunday. We had seven souls saved. I've been rejoicing about that all week long. Seven people got saved in this house Sunday. And maybe more after that that I'm not even aware of. Or maybe more, maybe folks got saved who watched this thing uh, alive on, uh, on YouTube. Folks, did you know that this past Sunday, this past week, this past week, we had nearly 5,000 people hit this ministry as it goes out at Temple Baptist Church on live stream. That's just live stream. That's just live stream. That's not, that's not the other websites. That's not uh, sermon audio. That's just live stream. Almost 5,000 people logged on and tapped in to this ministry. And I want you to understand, please, in the spirit that I give this, this is not to brag. This is to tell you that God's got his hand on this church. There's no doubt about it. He's got his hand on this church. And, uh, and, he, had his, and he was here Sunday. And, and, I, and I thank God for it. He was here Sunday. And it helped me. Uh, I was talking to the Lord about what he wanted me, want me to talk about tonight. And I'm going to tell you what I'm going to talk about. And I won't take long doing it. But I'm going to talk about the things that I've learned from the day that I was converted to Christ. In 1969, I got out of the military. I came home, got a job, went to work. If you had come up to me in 1969 and, says, and said to me, just a few years from now, you'll be up preaching the word of God, I'd looked at you and said, you're a fool. I'd have cussed you out to your face. I've always been a skeptic, always. I've never been somebody that believes easily, never have been. And I would have called you everything under the sun if you'd have said that to me in 1969. In 1973, for the first time in my life, conviction came on me, real conviction. A dread came over me like I'd never had before in my life. That got my attention. I'd never felt like I'd felt like that before, never, never. And it wasn't long after that, just a few days, that I bowed my head and asked God to save my soul. And when I didn't raise my head back up, my life changed immediately. Somebody came inside me that wasn't in there before. I was born again. I went back into a church that had a lot of religious people in it, many of them good moral people. And I went into that church. It wasn't long after being in that church that I found out many of those people witnessed and rejoiced with what I had because they had the same thing. But many of them didn't have a clue, yet they were faithful church members. My experience now for 40 years nearly pastoring a church has been that there's a lot of good moral people who go to the churches every Sunday, teach Sunday school, even preachers up in the pulpit who don't have a clue what you're talking about with the new birth. They think it's all up here because that's all they've got is what's up here. I had to wrestle and struggle with a lot of things when it came to doctrine and theology. I'm still developing opinions on certain things. I'm a far cry from what I was 40 years ago. I took some dogmatic positions back then knowing, knowing just a few things or knowing a little bit about a few things and took a dogmatic position. My nature has always been to defend a position and to come to a conclusion. And sometimes when I come to a conclusion, I come to it too quickly. And that was out of ignorance and immaturity in the faith. I didn't have anybody back then that I could really look to who was what would be a mentor. Nobody ever did that. There was nobody around that could do that. So I, had, I was just cast out into the field, if you please. And I had to find my own way. And I did a lot of praying, did a lot of reading. But over time, things began to develop in me, things that I know came from God. 
And there's no doubt in my mind about it. This is why I'm so certain about certain things and so uncertain about other things. I hear men get up in the pulpit, and, and I know they're pandering to a, uh, to a congregation. I know that. And they get up and they dogmatically assert certain things that they don't have a clue about. And I know they don't. And I know they don't. And I know they know they don't. And if they, know they, and if they don't know they don't, <laughs> then they're in bad shape. But the truth of the matter is, there are certain things that I preach to people that I know to be true. You've got to be born again. And you cannot get up out of your seat and walk down here and just get on your knees tonight and say, God save me. Well, I sprayed the prayer. Everything's okay. Hallelujah, hunky-dory. Let's get to work. No, that won't work. That won't work. The Holy Spirit has got to call you. You'll never come for the new birth. I've learned some things about God. I've just learned them. I know. I know somebody came inside me that wasn't in there before. I met him. He's in there. I, the Bible that was as cold to me, I, wouldn't, I had no use for this book. I used to read everything in the world but the Bible. and nothing in there. That didn't talk to me until I got saved. And then when I opened up the book, it started talking to me like it never had before. To me, that's one of the surest signs that something profound had changed because the one book that I hated and had no use for now fed my soul. The Bible, it began to speak to me. I had a hunger to go to church. I had a hunger to sit there and hear the Word of God preached. I wanted to be around spiritual things. I wanted to be around people who love the Lord. That's where I wanted to be. That's where I found myself. That's where I was because I identified with them. That's who I was. They and I, they and I shared the same thing. We believed in the same God. We'd had the same experience. But it wasn't long after I was saved that the old man raised his. He stayed hidden for a while because he was overwhelmed by the power of the Holy Ghost. But it wasn't long afterward that the old man raised his head back up again. And I was really shocked at the power that he still had in my life. I was amazed at what he was able to do. And some of the biggest battles you'll ever fight are the battles you fight in your mind because the old man knows how to reason with you. Now he'll say to him, okay, now that's all right what happened to you, but let's not get too carried away with this. You know, he'll start talking to you. He'll reason with you. And, 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 and some, of the, some, of the, some of the best conversations I've ever had is with the devil. <laughs> if you want to talk, if you want to, if you want to sit down and talk to one who will talk to you, oh, the devil will talk to you, believe me. Oh, yeah, <laughs> he'll talk to you. And so it took me a while to understand the real nature of the battle. The nature of the battle is not quitting sin. The nature of the battle is making Christ Lord in your life. What will give you victory and power in this world is not this list of do's and don'ts that you've got created somewhere. That's not going to give you any power. What gives you power is a living relationship with the Son of God. And the only, and you can't hear them, I learned some things too about that. And I learned them the hard way. There is no substitute for taking scripture in, meditating on the Bible and prayer. And if you don't have these two elements in your Christian life, you're playing. It's not that you've given up your faith, but your faith is not going to grow. And you always know when that lightness and that spiritual lightness comes into your heart and that fellowship and joy begins to jump up and down inside your soul and you know you're walking with the Lord. How many know what I'm talking about tonight? You know you're walking with God. And you, you can't, you can't uh, imitate that. I mean, you can go get yourself all pumped up in religious services and get yourself all hyped up, uh, you know, over a lot of different things and uh, over people or over this or over this movement or this church or this, that, but it won't last. But this inward joy, this, 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 this something that's just, you can't explain it, but it's real. You just feel something going on inside of you that's good. That's when you're walking with God. Amen. You're walking with God. And I know what it is to be on the mountaintop. And I know what it is to hit the valley. That's part of the Christian life. Oh, I, let me tell you, if it was left up to me, I'd stay on top of the mountain. <laughs> the only place you'd find me is up there in the clouds. Amen. <laughs> but it won't work that way. You don't grow on the mountain. You grow in the valley. It's in the valley he restoreth my soul. It's in the valley where you find the power of God moving in your life. See, you'll never really grow out of your immaturity in Christ until you begin to really understand who God is and who Christ is. 
You'll find a love for him growing in your heart too. You'll find yourself offended when somebody begins to throw his name around and drag him down through the mud and pull him down to their level. It offends you. You'll find it offends you greatly. You'll find that the Lord Jesus Christ is absolutely the, is, is the I guess, what, 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 what's the best way to put it? He's what you're thinking about. He's, he's the one who motivates your life. He's the one who, you're just talking to him. You, you're saying, Lord Jesus, I'm breathing here right now, but I may be breathing with you the next minute. And if I am, I'm ready. Here's my life, Lord. It's in your hands. Day in and day out, you get that spirit about you. Then you begin to understand the moving of the Holy Spirit in your life. Now there's all kinds of all kinds of, of, of uh, counterfeits to the Spirit of God. I got the Holy Ghost, the moving of the Spirit of God is the Wild West too of Christianity, like prophecy. Everything in the world is passed off as a power of the Holy Spirit, the moving of the Holy Spirit. But I have found that when the Holy Ghost really begins to move in someone's life, it doesn't make them strain. It doesn't put stress in their life. It doesn't drive them. It draws them. He draws you. There's a, there's a movement. There's a freedom. There's a joy. There's a singing in the heart. You learn that after years of, of this. You, you learn, that you, you, learn that, that you can come in and work up a crowd. There are some people that are good at it. I remember a man telling me one time we had our kids off somewhere at, at camp one summer, and, and it, was, it was a good camp, but, but he said to me, he said, oh, listen, he said, I know how to work up a crowd. He said, I know exactly how to get them down to the altar. Oh, I can have them boo-hoo, and we can have the tears flowing. I thought, I thought to myself, son, if that's all your faith is about, you're nothing in the world more than a, than a, than a sideshow barker. You're, you're just a, you're just a, you're just a, a Barnum and Bailey circus seller. That's all you are. That's all you are. You're not ministering anything to anybody. But I'm afraid that there's so much of that that goes on. I learned there'd be times that my faith had faltered and I'd get weak in my faith. Sometimes it came on gradually. I found every time that it ever did, though, I'd always wind up looking at people. It might not have started by looking at people. It might have started from disappointment. Your faith can get weak because God doesn't do what you think he ought to do. He did, you know, something happens that you can't explain, the unknowable, and your faith begins to get weak. But inevitably, when your faith starts to hit rock bottom, you got your eyes on people. Now, I don't know if it's because you're looking at people to try to justify yourself, make you feel better. Maybe you're trying to find somebody that, you can, that, that can help you. But that's when you get your eyes focused on people. And if you're there tonight where all you're thinking about is this hypocrite or that one did something to me or this one over here said something about me or, you know, I mean, after all, weren't they testifying the other day? Where are they tonight? And all this stuff, you got your, you got, you got your eyes on people. Your faith is shipwrecked. So what do you do, preacher? You, lift your, you let God lift you up above it. You let him you put your eyes on the Lord. We would see Jesus, the Greeks came. As long as Peter had his eyes on the Lord Jesus, he could walk on water. Don't get your eyes on men. Amen. Hey, man. Get them off of men because men will drag you down. Get your eyes on the Lord. I found out, though, God was long-suffering. I know it. He's long-suffering. Yeah, he is. That's a great comfort. Say, so why is it a comfort, preacher? Because sometimes we're stubborn. I don't know how many people have said, Preacher, you know what? God told me years ago I needed to get right. And I've drug around now. But finally, I got right with God and he welcomed me in with open arms. After years of God wooing and calling and begging and pleading, then they finally came to the Lord, came back to him. He's long suffering to usward. You learn that, don't you? I didn't get that from a book. I got that from experience. The Bible backs it up. But the problem is all these things that you know intellectually from the Scripture, you need to know experientially in your life. They're real. They're real. They're real. He will never leave you. He'll never leave you. <laughs> never, ever, ever, ever leave you. I learned that. I learned that. I learned that the Bible was the Word of God. I got messed up right after I got saved because of the 
I, I, I read everything I get my hands on. First thing I know, I got saved, and I got saved with a King James Bible. A, a deacon had a King James Bible open up and opened it up in front of me, and I said, yes, sir, I believe that. He said, you want to pray with me? Yes, sir, I'll pray with you. And I got down and I prayed, raised my head, and God saved me. I hadn't been saved any time. Somebody came along and said, here, this Bible over here is easier to understand. Well, if it is, let me have it. So I got that. I got good news for modern man. Started reading that. The NIV started reading that. All these other Bibles. Man, I got all kinds of Bibles piled up back there. You wouldn't believe the Bibles that I've got, but I only believe one. And I'm going to tell you why. It didn't come overnight. It came through years of experience. The King James Bible speaks to me. It speaks to me. It speaks to me like no other book does. And I'm going to tell you something now. This is, this is me. This is me. I don't know you, but this is me. There are passages in this Bible that I've read many, many times that I still don't understand. I don't understand them. I don't understand what he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 15 when he says being baptized for the dead. I don't understand that. You know, if you're proud and arrogant, you'll have an explanation. But I'd like to challenge you tonight to give me an explanation for being baptized for the dead. You can run to the Greek and say, well, it needed to be translated this way and blah, blah. On you go. Sure. What about there in John chapter number one where it says, He's the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now that's what it says in your King James Bible. Well, you can run to the Greek text and some of the commentators will put it this way. Coming into the world, He's the light that lighteth every man. They put the emphasis upon the fact that He came into the world and by coming into the world, He lights every man. But he comes in the world, coming into the world, he's the light, see. Whether every man gets it or not, it's up to the every man. But in, in, in John chapter number one, he's the light that lighteth every man. Now there's a difference in the meaning there. Complete difference. How do you understand that? I ask you a simple question tonight. If a man has never heard the gospel of Christ, never heard it, never seen a Bible, never heard a preacher. How is Christ the light that lighteth that man? Now listen, please, please don't get confused. I believe it. That's my next point. I believe the Bible. <laughs> I believe everything this book says. That gives me great comfort. I don't open the Bible looking for errors and mistakes. No, sir. When I get up here on Sunday and open up this book and begin to preach the Bible, I'm preaching a book I believe. I believe every word of it. But over there, when it says, He's the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world, I don't understand how that applies yet. Do you? That's not simple. <laughs> Is it? No, that's not simple. You see, here's what happens. When you first start in your Christian walk, most of the time your arrogance and pride will not let you say, well, you know, there's some passages in there. I just absolutely, I mean, after 20 years of reading it, I still don't understand it. Don't understand it. And leave it up to God, being the mind of the Almighty, to put it in the book. And when he gets ready, he'll make it known in the way he chooses to make it known. It's like the Apostle Paul there at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, in Athens, Greece. He had the Stoics and the Epicureans. They were sitting there waiting to hear some new thing. And they said, who is this babbler talking about the Apostle Paul? And they had an image or an altar to the unknown God. And the Apostle Paul said, let me tell you about him. He said, there was a time when God winked at this ignorance. Okay. But now commendeth all men everywhere to repent. All right. When was that time? And who was involved in that time? Where was that? How long did that last? See what I mean? You can go back to the Old Testament and you'll find Abimelech, the king of Gerar, a pagan king preaching to Abraham. <laughs> oh, yeah. You'll find Jethro. How many know who Jethro was? You all know who he was? He was the priest of Midian. A Midianite. Jethro was the priest of Midian. His daughter became the bride of Moses. 
right? Yeah. <clears throat> you see, the Bible is not written to give you a systematic book of theology for the Baptist church to fold up and say, this is the way it is. No. The Bible is written about the, about the history of mankind from the first man, Adam, until you're sitting here right now and God's revelation of himself to man. That's what the Bible's written for. That's why it's written. God's progressive revelation of himself to man. The other night I was going through the book of Revelation again. And it says in Revelation chapter number 11 that during the time of the two witnesses, whoever they are, Moses, Elijah, Enoch, so I believe it's Moses and Elijah, but anyway, during the period of that time, the Bible says, and the mystery of God will be revealed. I may remember reading that. The mystery of God fitting in with all the other mysteries in the Bible. What's that mean? See, that's what, what's that mean? All I'm doing is just trying to show you the book is a powerful thing. And you can, you can be a Greek scholar or a Hebrew scholar and still not have the answer. Don't let them flim-flam you. Just because they've had all that, don't let them flim-flam you. Just take this book and say, Lord God, I believe your word. I believe this Bible. And you show me what you want me to know from this Bible. And if, I don't, if, if you haven't showed it to me, I'm still going to believe it. And I'm going to trust it. And I'm going to preach it. And I'm going to teach it. And I'm going to love it. And I'm going to read it. And it's your word. And that will make a big difference in your walk with the Lord. So I've learned that. The Apostle Paul said this. He said, I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I finished my course. I don't know how much time I've got left in my course. I don't know. I'm not worried about it. That's up to God. That's something else you learn. <laughs> That's up to the Lord. But I do know this. I do know that on the end of my life, and that's where I am now, the sunset years of my life, however many they may be, folks, my life is more fulfilled now, more blessed now. Amen. I have more of a motive to live now. I'm telling you right now, you can't come down to an agent time in your life where I am. You see these people out here that have retired, some of them, and they are atheists and agnostics, and they are the most miserable people on the face of the earth because they got no hope. There's nothing awaiting them but a hole in the ground, they think. But me, the outward man is perishing, but the inward man is renewed day by day. I think a lot about heaven, and I think a lot about the ones that I'll see when I get there. And I think about the one who there, that I'll see him as he is. I think about that. I think about that. I think about how that any minute I could cross over from here to there. And I'm not worried about today and I'm not worried about tomorrow. I just want to make sure that I'm prayed up and ready to go. That's all that matters. If I'm prayed up and ready to go, then I'm, uh, what more, what better life can you live than that? Sunday help me. Somebody sent a thing to C.T. Townsend and said, whatever you might have done Sunday, you helped that old preacher. You helped him. And he did. Hallelujah to God. I'm glad I love preaching. <laughs> Amen. All right. Well, I hope a little bit said something tonight that a lot of these things I wish somebody had said to me when I first got saved. Father, I bless your holy name, Lord. I thank you for who you are and what you've done for me, where you brought me from. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> from where you brought me from, what I used to be, Lord, I'm not anymore. Hallelujah to thy holy name. Bless thy righteous name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.